would like to invite you for our uh, first sermon on Second Timothy, uh, and the title is Model Sound Teaching. Uh, let us pray, Lord. We ask that you guide us as we reflect on your word today. Teach us from your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In verses 1 to 12, Paul reminds Timothy of the blessings that are his in Christ. He reminds him that his, that his grace, mercy, and peace from God are available to him. And he tells him he's praying for him night and day. He assures him of love and that he's, he, 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 he's seeing him. Uh, and and when that, he longs to see him. He gives him verbal assurance that he's convinced that, that Timothy has genuine faith, which was in, in, the, in the grandmother and mother Lois. He also tells him in verse 6 that uh, he, he has this other blessing of a specific gift that God has given him to, to do the work of God. We, we say that what God has done for Timothy by giving him uh, a gift is, a, is, is, is true for every believer. God has given, gifted each one of us uh, 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 with a gift which we must put to use. To use. He's called to serve with power, love, and self-discipline. He's called to be a man who serves with conviction, just as the Apostle Paul himself served boldly because he was convinced that God was able to to guard what he interested him until that day. So in our text today, the apostle encourages Timothy on, uh, uh, and let's read the text. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith, love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Uh, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagelas and Homogenes, May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesphorus because he refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he's helped me in Ephesus. So you see, again, there are many lessons in this brief text, but we'll pick up only three lessons for today. One, you see, uh, uh, Paul presents himself as a model, and he calls uh, Timothy to be a model. Uh, he says to him, what you've heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith, love, and Christ Jesus. The apostle was a model for sound teaching. He did not just tell people what to do and what to believe. He was an example of it. And so we don't, later on, we, we, in, in, uh, in uh, chapter 4, he says, uh, sounds a warning, saying, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But one, but, but, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. You see, we know this time that the Apostle Paul predicts is already here. People can no longer endure sound doctrine. So a lot of what we hear today is an adulterated word. You see, it is therefore not surprising that the preachers who that preachers who make that choice are able to scandalize a whole city but continue to have growing crowds because people are looking for those who will, who will uh, tickle their ears. The popular teachers of our town cannot endure sound doctrine, they, but they continue to attract crowds. The Apostle Paul told us a long time ago that this time is coming when people will be looking for those who tickle their ears. Sound doctrine cannot tickle your ears because sound doctrine has a way of balancing the different shades of the truth. See, think for instance about God's character. God, God is a loving God. He is a God who has given his son to die for us on, a, 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 on the cross. He will leave the 99 for one lost sheep. But our God is also a judge. So as youth reflect on the God who loves, you must understand is a God who has set a day on which men will be brought to account. Now, sound doctrine will also tell you that our God is present. He is involved in our day-to-day -day life. He's a God who's concerned about us. 
some of us even sing mumulira mumugongo mumulira because we 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 want to think about a god who is involved in the day to day affairs of our life is an eminent god is a present god but also the bible presents a god who is transcendent who is a little removed from us who you cannot quite comprehend so that human beings cannot quite define god in his totality because they are limited sound doctrine enables us to see god's the full picture of god where false teaching only picks up those aspects of of god which sound good to us we pick and choose next So what does this mean at KBC? How do we distinguish false teachers from 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 sound doctrine? There are many signs, but at least three texts. Test one: Does the teaching point to Christ for our sustenance? Many exciting messages in our time, delivered in the name of Christ, ask us to look to someone else for our sustenance. Christ is the source of, of, of who is our source uh, and sustainer for our salvation. Our culture often offers quick fixes. The culture gives us an elevated view of ourselves sometimes and invites us to look at ourselves. Or invites us to look at something tangible or some authority for sustenance other than Christ and the cross. A lot of false teaching in our day elevates a man, a so-called man of God above Christ. All those are counterfeits and limited. When we look at Christ, we know we cannot face we can face life's challenge. We, when we look at Christ and really in the way he, he, in, for who he really is, we cannot face life challenges alone. When we look to him, our options are limitless because he's an almighty God. So does what you hear uh, uh, really affirm Christ? Two, does what you hear affirm the primacy of scripture? Simply put, scripture is a special revelation which God has revealed and reveals to us our salvation, our growth, our sanctification. It tells us God's mind uh, about us. So any messages that put scripture aside and ignore the authority of scripture or goes against, or goes against the foundational teachings of scripture is to be avoided, is to be disparaged. The third test is, does it proclaim the gospel? You see, the bottom line is we should always ask, does the study proclaim the gospel? That is the person and work of Christ and how we acquire the benefits of his person and work. It is possible to get excited about something and, and some soaring special stories that itch the ears and, 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 and shake the listener and make him feel good. But when it is all said and done, the message is lacking in the gospel. So, uh, like Paul, we are called to be a model for sound teaching. Are you a model for sound teaching? The second uh, thing uh, that is, is we see in this text is, is a call to guard the deposit. But what does a deposit mean in this text? You see, in, in verse 11 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, Paul talks about the sound doctrine that, conform, that conforms uh, to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. In chapter 6, verse 2 of, this, uh, of 1 Timothy, he admonished Timothy to guard the deposit entrusted to him. In chapter uh, 1, verse 12 of 2 Timothy, he makes reference to this treasure when he wrote that I'm not ashamed for I know whom I believe and I'm convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. In chapter uh, 1, verse 14, the apostle Paul urges Timothy by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us to guard the deposit entrusted to us. And then in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, uh, Paul is, uh, again instructs Timothy that what you have heard from me entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So when you really look at the totality of these verses, we know that we are really talking about the good deposit, which is the gospel that and all that accompanies this truth in scripture, that he's talking about the, the, the gospel as the deposit. Therefore, you must see the gospel which you have received and on which you stand as a deposit entrusted to you, child of God, by God himself. This gospel is not just entrusted to the pastor or the elders or minister leaders. It is a gospel entrusted to every believer. We are called to live the gospel, to express the gospel, just like, like Eunice and Lois, uh, who are really not pastors, but exercise their faith in their family so that, that, their, uh, that Timothy really came to, to be a part of the story of faith. 
And that's why Paul says in this, in verse 5 of chapter 1, that I'm not, um, I remind you of your sincere, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. You see, one of the best uh, ways to guard the gospel is to pass it on, is to, to, to live life in a way that passes on the gospel. This is not just a responsibility of the pastor, of the elders, of the deacons, of the ministry leaders. It's a, it's, it's a responsibility entrusted to every believer. It, it, we are entrusted with the gospel, uh, and, uh, and so the gospel should never really end with us. It must be passed on. So, child of God, have you, what have you done to share the gospel this week? This has been ent entrusted to you. The third thing is we're called to be faithful. Paul says to Timothy, you know that everyone in the province of, uh, of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hymon Ogenus. May the Lord show mercy to the house of all Lord for us, because he often refreshed me and was not, not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. Now, these three verse, uh, the, uh, in these verses, there are three names mentioned. The first two names are mentioned uh, because they stand out among those who deserted the Apostle Paul because he was in chains. On the other hand, Onesphorus, the one man who represents a few of those who were able to stand with Paul. He says, uh, he searched hard for me in, in Ephesus. I imagine that finding prisoners was not casual in those days. Knowing where he was, where he had been incarcerated, in prison, was probably not a simple thing. It is possible that those who deserted did not did it out of fear. Uh, because really there was a persecution going on at the time. Maybe they just didn't want to pay the price. So out of fear, they deserted Paul. And among those, the names who deserted Paul is there's those two men, Phagelas and, and, uh, and Homogenes. Homogeneous, uh, whatever the uh, trans pronunciation is. Now, studying the times, we imagine that they feared the possibility of persecution if they were identified with Paul. Now, I just, several years ago, I remember being uh, in a room where f past, uh, 40 pastors had been invited by a top politician in our country. And he was presenting an agenda that was really inconsistent with our calling as the pastors who were in that room. And so I remember this banter between me and him really arguing about what he was presenting and really feeling alone because all the pastors had kept quiet. We got out of the room and several pastors came to me and said, really what you are saying was really valid. And then, but then I said, you know, when we were in there, you left me alone. They, they, because of their fear for the powers that be, they kept quiet. And we are always tempted to, 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 to shut down the, the, the truth. And we're not able to stand in a moment of truth because we fear the powers that be. Maybe these, these uh, two men and uh, among others deserted Paul because of their fear. There's another name which I imagine is not the only name. Just as the two names stand out uh, uh, on the negative side, this name stands out among the faithful. The name is Onesphorus, and, and this name means useful. And in this id, Onesphorus' life was useful. It was consistent with his name. The apostle found him faithful because he, uh, he was faithful. He was useful. Think about your own life. Are you faithful? Are you useful to the kingdom? The, court, the text we've looked at calls us to be faithful. It calls us, first of all, to be models, a people who keep sound doctrine and pass it on to others. Second, it calls us to guard the deposit, a people who make the gospel a priority in both our words, in our actions. And, and it calls us to be faithful, even when it may, means that we are on the minority side. I don't know which side you are on. Are you among the faithful? Are you among the unfaithful? May the Lord give you the strength to be faithful to the very end, because he has talked about in this passage the day uh, 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 to which every Christian must look, the final day when we'll all be brought before the presence of God for, to, to receive our rewards. Are you faithful? May God, the Lord help you to be faithful. God bless you.